Welcome to the first session of the Miming of Mark Fisher, our production and as its communist strategy. Today, Mark Fisher first book, Capital Rallies, is as relevant as ever. In the last two years, Evan Fisher himself has become a community, featured in memes who circulate providing common of social media giants. This seminar look at the trajectory from the publication of Capital Rallies and the theory blogging community from which emerged to the meme and YouTube culture of post-COVID era, and ask if there can be any resistance to capitalism from the online of in real life culture field. We will try Fisher treatment of the neoliberal notion that there is no alternative predictive on the tendency of capitalism to co-opt all creative opposition. Back to the Frankfurt School, which will provide us with the tools to analyze Fisher last unfinished work as it communists. Adorno Schulter, Benjamin Fantasmagoria, and Marcus Ray Refusal. We'll all be contextualized in terms of the relevance of the post COVID society in which a generation that has been denied its right to passion, including drugs and social experimentation, will emerge from lockdown to meet the solutionary mass of unemployed people. How will such a mass view of the ratification of society? What resistance there? be to the normalization of the lockdown era restraint. In particular, this course will ask whether there can be an easy critique of society from within the meme sphere or the wild control field, as long as the capital force control the means of memes of production. Utilizing the terms acid communist and acid left, together with Fisher proposal that we foster a contracultural movement to raise class conscience, we will ask whether a post-COVID society might be ripe for a culturally orientation protest movement and how the tools of online and official contemporary art culture might be used along grassroots initiative. To what degree does Fisher ultimate adorno identification of the possibility of witnessing glimmer of alternative political and economic possibility within the Ossifal Hall remain valid today? This course, bleeding critical theory with aesthetic and political theory, will focus on the questions around the perspective useful of creative production in the arts and new media for the dissemination of the philosophical and political messages. During this course, students will read the discourse work by Adorno, Benjamin, Butler, Fisher, Marcus, and Santa, as well as looking at artistic action and movements that have put into practice the finding of critical theory by utilizing art as a form of protest of modeling for political action. And our instruction is Mike Watson. He has a PhD at Goldmeads College. He's a theorist, critic, and curator whose principal focus on the relation between culture, new media, and politics. He has writing for our review, our forum, Fries, Hyperallergic, and Radical Philosophy, and has curated events like 55 and 56, Venice Venial, and Manifesto 12, Palermo. In September 2021, he has published his third book with zero books, The Meaning of Mark Fisher, How the Frankfurt School Forecast Capital Realms and What to Do About It. So here we go, Mike, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for all coming. I'm happy to be here. Um, so thanks for the introduction as well. Uh, okay, so I think I'll start saying a little bit about myself and then we'll lead into the into um, some more details about the course. So you've read the syllabus by now, I'll talk a little bit more about what we're gonna be doing over the next four sessions. Um, right, so some of you may know something about me, um, but okay, to go to trace things back a little bit and to give my motivation for, for being here and for, for doing what I'm currently doing, which is principally to research internet culture and its links to, to the political left. Okay, um, this basically came from an engagement in the art world. So I actually started off working as an art critic and curator about 10 years ago in Italy. So I, I started studying a PhD at Goldsmiths College in London, which I actually finished, but I ended up writing most of my thesis in Italy, where I lived. And at some point after finishing my, my PhD, I started looking for opportunities to publish 
much like you are starting to do, and, and, and maybe some of you are already doing this, but I started looking for ways to get my writing out there. And because I was living in Italy at that time, I felt that maybe the best way of publishing my writing, one of, one of the easiest ways to start practicing as a theorist was to write as an art critic. So I began looking at local galleries and writing for magazines such as Art Review, Freeze, uh, more recently Art Forum. So, you know, big international art magazines you might be familiar with. And this led me to very quickly uh, start curating exhibitions and actually quite big exhibitions in major museums in Rome uh, and across Italy and also in the uh, Venice Biennale, the Biennale di Venezia, which you might know, which is a big biannual um, art show that spans the whole of the, the main island of, of Venice. And um, I worked principally in political art. So I worked as a curator and, and theorist of, um, of basically art and politics. And this was at a time when political art was really expanding. So I don't know how old most of you are. I guess maybe a lot of you are a bit younger than me, but we didn't have as much political art as we now have up until the financial crisis of 2007 to 2008. So if you recall that, um, there was suddenly this collapse in, um, in, in banking and then in, in um, national currencies. And um, this created a kind of global panic and, and, and a mass resistance to, to capitalism, firstly because of the original crisis and then because of the solution. Because basically what happened is that um, governments across the world started making the taxpayer pay to rescue the banks. So this seemed very unfair. So you started to have protests from movements such as um, Occupy, for example, or the indignant movement in, in Spain. And there were a number of movements in Italy as well. Um, basically, um, you just had this huge explosion of, of political art making. So obviously there was already a lot of, there were already people making political art, but it became much bigger. And in some senses, this was, was, was positive. But in other senses, actually, what you had was a situation where the art world was trying to excuse itself. It was trying to um, whitewash itself. OK, so the art world is to a large degree complicit with the world of finance capitalism. OK, so we'll talk about this maybe more later. Um, but I saw a lot of hypocrisy basically in the art world. Um, I really felt that you know, the, the attempts to politicize art were really very superficial. And I also saw that the art world was very um, class-based. It was really based on the social class hierarchy. So most people in the art world are middle class. This is, there is no doubt. Um, and actually most people in the art world in Italy where I was, were upper middle class um, and even aristocratic. So if you're not, you know, from a wealthy background, it's very hard to survive in the art world. So I became very disillusioned. Um, and I started to look elsewhere. So I basically kind of left the art world, although I still, I still work as a curator and a critic. But I started looking to the internet because I felt that where in the art world, everyone's speaking about uh, an art for everyone. Like the, the whole thing, you know, if you go to museums, if you listen to um, government um, policies on the arts, uh, certainly from what I know in, in, in Europe, you may have other experiences, but governments talk about making an art for everyone, an art in which everyone can participate. So the kind of avant-garde dream of an art for everyone that comes down from the, the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, has kind of filtered into government art policy making, but it's very, um, again, it's very superficial. Uh, actually, the art for everyone that everyone is talking about doesn't exist in the art world. It exists actually online, if it exists anywhere. So I really got inspired. Um, I mean, I've been like heavily online, you know, since the night, since like the late 1990s. Um, but I mean, I, I, I became kind of newly inspired by uh, meme production, YouTube video making, and and Twitch live streaming, and 
I started to um, believe that maybe uh, the answer, the, the way to make an art for all, you know, it, it kind of existed in the online realm rather than the, in the art world. So that's kind of how I got here. So that's how I got to writing the book that you all possibly know something about, which is a, it's out of focus. Anyway, you know, you know the book, The Meming of Mark Fisher, um, which uh, talks a lot about where we are now in terms of uh, internet culture and, and uses Fisher and the Frankfurt School to examine uh, the online left and actually, you know, a lot of problems with the online left. So I found problems with the art world, migrated online and then found problems with, with, with online culture. So, I mean, obviously these things exist everywhere. So, so um, the book really is about how, you know, even the anti-capitalist, socialist, communist, anarchist, online left has been co-opted. That, that you can't you can't not be co-opted and by that i mean like taken over by capitalism so um i'm dealing with this problem in the book and the book has been controversial probably some of you have seen um for various reasons but maybe we'll talk about that as we go through but i'm going to open up my slides now Okay, can you see those? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, right, you, yeah, you see it now. So, so we just had a, a, a read through of the uh, course description, so I won't go over that again. But I mean, it starts by talking about capitalist realism. Okay, so I said in the syllabus, if you saw it, if you can read that book before you start, the course that would be helpful i mean probably nearly everyone's already read it um but it's just some background we won't talk all of, all the time about the book but it's good to have you know that you know as background so the things that really concern us about capitalist realism are the things i've written at the bottom of the slides here so is reality capitalist okay so you get this line here that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, which comes from various people. Um, but I think Fisher says that he, he got that from Zizek and Frederick Jameson. Um, and there's this acronym TINA, there is no alternative. So the, the book itself is, you know, the whole thing about the book, it's actually in the subtitle, is, is there no alternative or is there an alternative to capitalism? So. You know, that's one of our questions, I think. And it's a question that really was put forward much earlier by the Frankfurt School. So this is where I get this kind of link between Fisher and the Frankfurt School. And I think it's very interesting or very important for people today who are getting interested in, in leftism through memes to trace back this history, because it's great that people are getting into Mark Fisher, but I think it's also useful that they can understand that there's a whole context before Fisher. Um, so Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, Benjamin, etc., from the, I think the second generation of the Frankfurt School, all really talked about this same, this same thing, that, that there's no way out of capitalism. And the other thing that Fisher has in common with the Frankfurt School is that he calls for an artistic or creative response. So it's strangely overlooked a lot in analyses of capitalist realism that one of the most important things about the book is that he says that we need some kind of um, some kind of uh, cultural response and a kind of weird, uh, strange, unexpected response is actually on page 75 to 76 of Capitalist Realism. Um, he says that capitalism, it claims to fulfill our desires but actually it doesn't do that at all. And, and, and if you look at what our desires are, they're not the things that are fulfilled by capitalist bureaucracy. They're something strange, unexpected and weird. And, and those things we need to fulfill through, he basically suggests, I don't think he says it literally, but through artistic creation. Um, so, um, you know, I think that's very important. And actually even the way that he starts the whole book um, looking at um, this film, uh, Children of Men, 
and the way children and men opens up with uh shots of the inside of an art museum um there's this guy that, he, that the the main character goes and talks to in children and men and and, and they're actually inside this kind of disused abandoned art museum and i think that's a very meaningful um image and i think uh, fisher definitely saw that as important so you know um really what i'm doing in this course is looking at those aspects of capitalist realism and relating them to the frankfurt school and then saying look we're in this kind of very unusual time we're coming out of covid or we think we are yeah we're coming out of this pandemic and we're opening up onto a new world and we're also very online so there's you know suddenly you know we're put in a position of where we're more online than ever because we have to be online the last two years we've mostly had to be online because of lockdowns and so this online situation gives us an ability that we've never had before to connect with each other and there's been a massive growth in this period in the online left and online meme creation uh etc but suddenly we're going to be allowed out again or we you know we kind of are allowed out again but suddenly we're in that situation where we, we we're put out into the world again and we have to work out what we're going to do with that and the question on this course, really, that we're going to be looking at is, uh, can we somehow use the online left to build a, a real life movement? And what role does art and what role do art and memes play in that experience? So that's basically how we're going to, That's basically what we're going to talk about anyway. OK, so um, you have a document in Google Classroom. I think it's called. Is it called Classwork? Hang on. Oh, yeah, sorry, the Classwork tab. Uh, you, I don't know if you can now see that. You probably can. OK, um, you should have a document called Overview of Projects and Grading. OK, you all have that. So you can try and open it or I can take you through it so you only have two documents you have the syllabus again we've actually corrected a small mistake there today so you have that in there and you have this one that we're going to look at now so this will basically tell you what what we're doing okay so at the top of that document it basically says uh you will have a group project so you're going to get into groups of about four um, by next week, maybe three. Okay, there'll probably be a couple of threes, but maximum four. And you'll produce by two weeks after the course a activist uh, meme campaign. Okay, so we can't do big art projects. We're going to talk about art as well, but we can't make you know these big art projects um you're going to make some kind of meme campaign relevant to an issue that that you choose okay so you're going to get in your groups maybe with people you know or i don't know how you're going to organize yourself and then you'll need to agree you know a theme that could be ecological it could be about fair pay um i mean you can think of your your own themes but obviously you know you're all you, you all have strong ideas i guess um so what's actually going to happen i'm not sure if it says it here yes okay um so the next part here says students uh should be able to articulate what elements of their campaign are successful and what elements are not successful so you're basically gonna have a a, a presentation okay so like you do when you uh you know, when you normally make a presentation, you're going to you're going to basically uh, discuss your meme campaigns and you're basically going to have a few memes and you're going to say, OK, um, we decided to make our campaign about fair pay and we chose to make these kind of memes and we think they're successful for this reason and this reason. Um, and you're going to basically do that in a let's say 20 minute video format so probably the best thing that you can do is get in your groups um choose a topic by next week 
And then after we finish the course, you will somehow find time to get together and record a video. I would suggest on Zoom or StreamYard or something. So you can just do as we're doing now and just use the record function. And it will just be you discussing your topic. Why have you chosen a particular political topic? Why is it important? And then why you think certain memes might help promote that topic. Or you might say that memes won't help. You might say that memes are useless. I don't know, you're gonna to have to decide this. Um, one suggestion I have is that you actually make that a little bit more interesting by pretending that you're making a broadcast, yeah? So you can make it in Zoom or StreamYard and you can make it so you're not broadcasting. So if you use StreamYard, which is a streaming software, you can choose to just record rather than streaming to Twitch. So you basically, you know, you could basically, you know, you can make a stream, but not actually stream, or you could even stream if you want. But, you know, rather than just doing this thing of like, you know, doing this thing for the professor or for the, the, the tutor, for me, in some educational environment, you can make it a bit real and engage a bit more with this idea of, you know, whether the online left is useful by actually making a kind of pretend, you know, video, video stream or, or you know, whatever you have, you want to see it. Um, that's just one idea. So, you know, it makes it a bit more real. Um, so we can talk about that more if you have any questions, then you can email me. And then there is an individual essay. So the third point, students will write a, I've written 2000 words to 2400 word essay um, with references on the themes of the course. Okay, so there's actually some questions we'll go through shortly. So it's a standard essay. Um, you'll basically be talking about what role the online left might have in the post-COVID world and in, you know, promoting political concerns. So I guess you'll be thinking about your own political perspective a bit there, but we'll look at the questions shortly. So we can talk about this a bit more in a minute. So if I'm going quickly, then it's okay, we'll come back to this. Um, so by the next session, get in your groups and choose your topic for your group presentations. So just come to me next session and say like, you know, I'm in this group, we're four people, and we're actually going to make this presentation on trade unionization, on trade unions, because we think that, you know, everyone should be in a union, for example. And then find some memes on that topic so you know you're going to come to me in your group you're going to say this is my topic and here are some memes we found on instagram or tumblr or facebook or whatever not memes you make don't, don't do that yet but just so we can start discussing you know are these memes effective what makes a good meme etc okay so that's all you have to do for should we say homework Okay, so that's what you have to worry about now. I'm just going to show you your essay questions. Okay, so on your uh, document, this projects and grading, you have like these tables here. Like this is not very important, but some people like want to know how they're being graded. So it's all here. So if you want to know like, okay, so how are they going to, how is he going to grade me? You have a whole thing here that says you get five points for whether your presentation is appropriate for the topic and audience, etc. Yeah. At the end, there's an obvious conclusion summarizing the presentation. So the thing about presentations is a bit like essays, you need to have like a beginning, middle and end. So you need to have basically a bit where you go, um, I don't, maybe this is too, maybe I'm patronizing you here, but anyway, you, you, an, an essay has to have like a, an essay um, thesis statement at the beginning where you say like, this essay is about blah, blah, blah. And then you write, you know, the main essay, then you have a conclusion. So your, your presentations need to have some kind of similar format. Yeah, you're basically, it's basically like a, a, a spoken essay in, in video format. 
but you can go through all this stuff but this is just like extra stuff if you care about this stuff okay some people want to know you know how they're being assessed then there are some questions okay so these are the essay questions you can already see them now so if you have any questions about the questions then you can email me if you want to write your own question then also email me okay but these are the questions that i'd like you to look at if you have a very good reason why you want to write your own question then you know by all means come and talk to me or email me so these won't be very clear to you yet okay so you know don't worry if you don't understand anything but you should do later for example the first question what possibilities if any are available to leftist creative practitioners today to help achieve Adorno's shudder okay so some of you that doesn't mean anything yet but it should mean something um let's go down to the fourth one uh in the 1930s benjamin walter benjamin saw mass media as a threat to the status quo necessitating propaganda to divert people's attention from the wealth they sought um how is this situation paralleled now okay so that will be clearer at the end of this lesson okay um maybe it just maybe this is just a bit intimidating right now but these questions should all be clear soon if you have any any kind of uh queries then ask me uh in email later but there are the questions so you can already start to get an idea of what we have there okay so that's all just a lot of detail about the course and it's all there if you if you need to look back at it Okay, so there's one thing here is that I'm speaking English as an English person, <clears throat> so I might be going a bit fast, or you might just find my accent difficult. So if you have any problems, then just, you know, you can stop me and ask questions. I'll try and um, not go too fast. All right, so anyway, that's just, that, that is the book I wrote before the, the current book um but i'm actually going to start with with these books all right so these are books by uh, adorno and the first one was also co-written by porkheimer uh both of the frankfurt school so we're going to start here and basically we're talking a little bit about uh the frankfurt school and and what they did so i guess you're all to some degree familiar with the frankfurt school they're most famous for their concept of uh, the culture industry, which actually was developed by Adorno and Horkheimer in this book on the left here, The Dialectic of Enlightenment. So that book was written during World War II and basically Horkheimer and Adorno were both in exile from Nazi Germany. So they're philosophers who were working in Nazi Germany and as German left-wing um sorry as german uh left-wing jews they uh basically had to had to get out of of hitler's of hitler's germany and they fled uh eventually to the us and they carried on their work with the institute for social research which we tend to call the the frankfurt school okay uh, and it was a private institute which basically looked at um, Marxism, but it um, incorporated a cultural critique. Okay, so the main innovation of the Frankfurt School or the Institute for Social Research is that it um, it blended Marxist economics with cultural theory. Okay, with aesthetics, with, philosoph with philosophical aesthetics. And when uh, Horkheimer and Adorno got to America, they basically found that um, Americans, American society was controlled in ways that were quite similar to, to fascist society, to, 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 to Nazi Germany, to Italian fascist society, um, and to totalitarian uh, Soviet, the Soviet regime. 
So basically they said that, all right, you, you have the situation in America where people are offered um, unending freedom and choice. So the whole kind of, you know, the whole basis of capitalist democracy is that you're offered, um, you know, you're, you're offered uh, endless uh, possibilities that you can go to see, you know, this film or that film or that film, or you can read this magazine or you can choose that magazine instead. You know, there's, there, there, there's so many, you know, things, products people could consume. Uh, they weren't being told what to consume. But what Horkheimer and Adorno said is that actually everything they were being offered to consume was basically the same. OK, so they had these endless choices, but they were choosing between films and magazines and radio shows that all basically promoted a similar. Um, uh, a similar. How can I say it? Um, a similar kind of mode of being, a similar way of being. Um, and um, basically Adorno explains that this is due to what we call identity thinking. OK, so I'll just say that again. Identity thinking. So um, Adorno says that the big problem we have as humans is that we have a need to identify nature. We have a need to, um, to we, we basically have a fear of, of the outside world, of the world outside us, okay? So us as individual human subjects, okay, are frightened of things outside us, okay? So it's a simple subject and object uh, relation, okay? So we as individual subjects um, are in constant fear of, the object, okay, of nature, of other people, etc. So Adorno says the way we try and the way we try and cope with our fear of the outside world is by identifying, is by categorizing things. Okay, so we proceed by giving things names, by giving things numbers, etc. So Adorno and Horkheimer say in the dialectic of enlightenment. We've basically done this since the beginning of, uh, of humanity. Okay, so through through magic ritual, through Greek Greek mythology, um, through religion, and then later through um, science and and rationality, we we aim to kind of confine to restrict nature. Okay, um, and. Adorno say, Adorno Horkheimer say that, you know, where the Enlightenment project, where, it, you know, from the kind of uh, the pre-modern period, should we say um, 17th, 18th century, um, you know, where, where people started to say, okay, we need to step away from uh, religion, we need to start uh, throwing a light, we need to kind of uh, project a light on things, we need to start measuring categorizing things and and, 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 and being aware of, of the reality of things so that we don't get blinded by, um, you know, false religions, etc. They say that, you know, where we had the best intentions with the Enlightenment period, it actually ended up repeating the problem of identity thinking, that this idea that we would start to measure and categorize things scientifically, and that way we would no longer be be deceived by, for example, um, you know, large religious institutions. Uh, this idea ended up kind of trapping us in a new system of identification that, um, that we ended up being trapped by science itself. So that now we're all kind of identified by a number scheme. So, you know, this is capitalism. The, the, the end result of capitalism is that we all become uh, we all become basically um, wages, numbers, uh, uh, 10 pounds and 10 euros an hour, $10 an hour, $15 an hour. Okay, we're all worth something. Um, so we've ended up being trapped by the very system that we, that we um, developed to try and free us from this identification. So um, what Adorno says in aesthetic theory like 25 years later, the book he was writing when he died, uh, he died in 1969. Um, he says, well, actually he says it throughout his career, but he says it very clearly 
I think in in aesthetic theory, um, he says that through abstract art, we can somehow kind of explode this false identification that there's a moment when you're looking at abstract art or listening to music where you suddenly break out of your of your force of these false um, confines. OK, so um, they're two very important books. So aesthetic theory is on your reading list. And I said to read the chapter society. Um, and you have the PDF there. The thing is, a chapter society, like all of aesthetic theory, is extremely dense and difficult to understand. So if you tried to read society, you probably got scared um, because it, it doesn't make so much sense. Um, or there are bits that, that jump out and make sense. There are bits that, that are less clear. There are, there are a number of reasons for this, but it partly would be the translation because it's a translation from German. Um, but it's partly because it's an unfinished book. Adorno, as I say, he died when he was writing it. Uh, he hadn't finished it when he died. Um, but also Adorno was writing in this kind of deliberately fragmented method. So the Frankfurt School used this, what, what we call the, the philosophical fragment. Um, and the idea with the fragment is that where uh, contemporary life under capitalism was kind of fragmented um, that, that you would you would actually make philosophy in in small fragments to try and kind of create an, an abstraction that would be equal to the abstraction of capitalism to the confusion of capitalism so it's something that, that Walter Benjamin developed and it's something that Adorno also looked at uh, he had a book called uh, Minima Moralia, which is entirely made of fragments of, of small pieces of text. But in aesthetic theory, although you know he doesn't speci you don't specifically see lots of small paragraphs, you do see that he's still using this fragmented method, that he's he's kind of jumping around uh, in his text. So that also makes things difficult. So aesthetic theory is a, is a difficult text. If you get a chance, then do look at that book. Um, but I think the PDF you have, the bit you need to look at, really need to look at, is just page 244 to page 245. 244, 255. And I'll, I'll show you exactly what bits later on. But that's enough. There's enough in there for us to, to work with. Okay, I'm not seeing many faces. Uh, it makes it easier if I can see if people are, are there or not. Um, okay, so the Adornian shudder. So in the book uh, I showed you briefly earlier, my um, book, Can the Left Learn to Meme? I talk about this series called Stranger Things. I don't know if you know Stranger Things uh netflix series um so in stranger things you have uh this setup which is kind of ideal for talking about the shudder and it's the shudder that i really want to speak about now this 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 concept that adorno uses it's actually a concept that comes in to the dialectic of enlightenment but it also comes I already said it before, it comes in, you know, very clearly into this aesthetic theory. Uh, you can't see that properly anyway. Um, the, the PDF that you have. Um, so this concept of shudder is, is all through Adorno's work, um, from the Dialectic of Enlightenment up to his, his last unfinished work. Um, but it gets kind of lost in English translations. So in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, um, he keeps saying this word shudder in German is uh, schauder. But in both translations and English, it's lost. I don't know about Spanish. Um, I think in Italian, it's probably mistranslated as well. But in any case, um, it's there. This word shudder is there throughout his career. Um, the shudder is like, um, it's like when you're scared and your body moves, like, you know, this is a, this is a shudder. 
um, I don't know what it, again, what it is in Spanish, um, it, it, or in, in any of the languages you speak, because uh, we have so many different people here from different parts of the world, but you can, you can look it up sometime. Um, but anyway, look, so in the, in the Stranger Things, uh, they live in this town called Hawkins. And um, basically what happens is, okay, there's this Hawkins National Laboratory. Uh, there's this kind of secret military laboratory there. And I think this is kind of like a really useful metaphor because uh, it, within the town, within the TV series, it kind of stands for um, this kind of um, government and state power but really just power as such, like the, the tendency towards power and towards control, okay? So you have this kind of metaphor for control. And um, the Hawk in the Hawkins National Laboratory, they're basically doing these experiments and they've ended up making this kind of monster uh, and this kind of parallel world that's called the Upside Down. So beneath the whole of the Hawkins town, there's like a... a a mirror uh, of Hawkins, a kind of reverse mirror of Hawkins, uh, which is covered in this kind of slime. It's kind of this, this kind of dark copy of the town of Hawkins, but covered in this kind of slime and it's inhabited by, by monsters. And what happens um, is that these monsters from the upside down, they start to kind of escape into the real world. OK, uh, and I found this an interesting kind of metaphor for nature. OK, and, 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 the, and the way we try to hide nature, the way we try and um, protect ourselves against the, the fear of nature and the way nature always ends up breaking through anyway. The, 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 our lives, we, we're constantly trying to separate ourselves as, as humans from the fear of nature but it will always kind of break through. So this is the Hawkins National Laboratory. It's kind, of, it's kind of a metaphor for us and the way that we're trying to control, trying to control our surroundings. And um, um, I think this is very important right now because when you, when you talk about the fear of nature, it's not like, you know, I'm scared of uh, trees or lightning or, uh, volcanoes okay so you know if you think of the fear of nature you often think of these images of like volcanoes and earthquakes okay they're obviously scary things i guess but um i'm you know we're not talking about um when we say the fear of nature you know when, when adorno is writing again and again on the fear of nature he's not talking about you know i'm scared of the thunder or i'm scared of the earthquakes you know na nature is is the thing that kills us in the end all of us so you know, we're all scared of nature all the time. Um, obviously now we have COVID, uh, this COVID pandemic. So we have this very good example happening right now. And, and it was a very good instance of nature kind of reappearing into our comfortable scientific existence or rational existence. Um, so we can relate to this very clearly. But in any case, in... Um, Okay, so here you see, if you haven't seen Stranger Things, you see on the slideshow, the real world at the top and the upside down below. Okay, so um, what Adorno says is that, as I mentioned earlier, is that through abstract art, we can somehow reach a glimpse of the real conditions of existence. So in reality, we're not separate from nature, okay? We're actually, we actually are nature, you know, we're linked to nature. Humans and nature are, are the same thing, okay? Um, so this shudder for Adorno is a moment of looking at the artwork and becoming lost in the artwork. And, 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 and when you become lost in the artwork, because you're no longer differentiating between yourself and nature because you're lost you you, you actually you realize the, the the true conditions um of your relationship with with the natural object so in uh, stranger things you have um this woman here you can just 
see her head in her hands is Joyce Byers, and she has a son called Will Byers. And basically, Will is like the only person in the town who somehow has communication with this upside down world. Like he's under, he's kind of seeing what's happening with this kind of um, this evil world that's being created by the Hawkins Laboratory. And something that happens, I think it's in series two, I think it is, um, is that Will starts drawing. Like the, the thing with Will is that, okay, he can see this kind of uh, dark underworld and he can kind of understand what's happening. But to everyone else, he just seems to be uh, a depressed teenager. Okay, so there's two things happening. He has this kind of demeanor of a depressed teenager, but he also, you know, is in touch with this kind of underworld. And at some point, he starts like drawing frantically. You can see these drawings here on the slide. He starts drawing um, these kind of abstract drawings and these abstract scribbles. And what happens is that his mum just thinks he's gone crazy or she, you know, she, he, she thinks that his kind of the, the, these kind of intense drawings are a result of his kind of teenage anxiety and depression. But what happens at one point is that um, I think it's, it's his mum's boyfriend. Uh, he comes round to the house and he sees the drawings and he puts the drawings all together and he realizes that what they are is they're a map of the underworld. And by that point, I think that, that they've understood that there is this, this underworld is a thing that exists, this dark underworld. And so they realize that, the, that this thing that they thought was just like a, a, you know, a, um, a useless, um, crazy scribble drawing is actually, uh, it, actually had, it actually made sense. It actually reveals the truth um, about the, the existence of this underworld that runs parallel to to the town of Hawkins. Okay, so for me, it's a brilliant metaphor of how the the shutter works for Adorno. That what happens with the abstract art, with abstract art, is it reveals to you the the true conditions, the, the reality of of the existence of nature, and of our coexistence with nature. But I want to say that that is not a perfect an analogy. Okay, so it's kind of a good it's a good example, but it doesn't exactly explain what. Adorno is talking about. Um, okay, so there's a lot of text here, so don't worry about reading this text now. But this is the this is the bit of text that you need to be thinking about in um, the chapter society in aesthetic theory. So when I just said to you read the pages, you really need to read in aesthetic theory are two four four and two four five. This is like this is like the passage that is really important. OK, so it's not a very big passage, but I, I would read um, the page before and up to the end of that passage w w when you get to read it. If you haven't looked at it already, but like not now, but later. OK, um, so uh, I mean, right. I don't think you can really read that now. It's not going to make sense to read it whilst I'm speaking. So. What can we look at instead? Uh, um, so hang on, I'm just going to get rid of that altogether. Right, just for a second, um, if you can pay full attention. So if you can get this, if you can understand this once, then you've understand, you've understood, you know, something very important. Okay, so this is pretty much fundamental. So, OK, so you've all you've all basically um, had moments when you're listening to music. Maybe Pink Floyd, maybe, I don't know, maybe some dance music, some house music, some, I don't know, whatever. But, you know, you listen to that kind of music, some classical music where you start to kind of forget your surroundings. OK, so one immediately thinks of like smoking marijuana or something like that. I'm not saying one needs to do that. You know, you might, but you know, you might, you might think of that or, you know, you're partying. Maybe you've had some beers, maybe you haven't, maybe you don't do drugs, whatever. But those points when you're, you're absolutely relaxed, you're listening to some music and you start to lose your edges. Yeah. You're no longer thinking about 
um, the world around you. You're no longer thinking about um, doing the shopping or doing your writing your essay or you know what's happening on WhatsApp or whatever. Yeah, you're actually just completely lost. You're no longer aware. Of, you're no longer aware of yourself. Yeah, you've probably all had that experience. At some point, when you have that experience, something happens, and you're snapped out of that experience. Okay, that for Adorno is the shudder. Okay, the shudder, the shudder, is when you are pulled. You're pulled out of that moment of total relaxation. Okay, so in the moment of total loss it doesn't have to be relaxation but some kind of loss it can be a kind of sublime fear even but a loss in the artwork okay the moment when you're in that moment uh, when you're lost in the artwork when you're no longer thinking about even your own body yeah you 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 realize the true conditions of existence that there's no distinction between you and everything outside you yeah this is kind of a this is something that I think Fisher kind of talks about. He doesn't talk about Adorno's shudder, but he mentions psychedelia in his introduction to acid communism. And he mentions this kind of, you know, the psychedelia and the, the capacity psychedelia has for uniting things. There's that moment, which I think is the, the, the politically important aspect of psychedelia for Mark Fisher, is a moment where you feel that you're, at one with everything yeah um so for adorno he's not talking about drugs but he's saying that in the artwork you th th that kind of moment but that moment is kind of useless what's important isn't that moment it's a moment when you fall out of that moment this is a shock okay so shudder is like a shock okay um and it's in that shock that that's when you realize because when when you're lost when you're floating in that psychedelic experience, you can't think anything, you can't think coherent thoughts. You're not thinking, because thinking is something we do as humans. Thinking is, is always identity thinking. So when we're thinking, we're always identifying ourselves as separate from nature, okay? So it's in that moment, we can't think, you can't think, hey, wow, now I feel well, one with everything. You don't actually think that when you're at one with everything. That's not what's happening. That thought you're having after that moment passes, yeah? So when the shudder is when you snap out of that moment of oneness, you have a shock, you feel that shock. And that for Adorno is crucial, okay? That we can feel that shock. And then you realize that there, that you realize what you've lost, that there was a moment when you felt connected with nature and with everything around you, okay? And there no longer is that moment. When you snap out of that moment, as soon as you realize that you were experiencing that, you've lost that, you've lost that capacity. But what Adorno wants you to get from that moment, from the shudder, is he wants you to keep it in mind as an example of how we can coexist. Yeah. So this shudder, which can never really be used politically, because it you know, you only realize you, it happened when it's already passed. It still stands as, as an example of the fact that we can coexist with nature, that, there, that, that that is the real condition of existence. Okay, so. That's basically what is being said here in society, the chapter from aesthetic theory. Um, so the very beginning of this quote says this shock, uh, Schrecken in German, uh, is a moment at which the recipient, the, the audience of art, forget themselves and disappear into the work. OK, so he's talking about this, you know, this moment of losing yourself. And then he goes on and he talks about this happening in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. OK. So this is the Ode to Joy. It's the, actually the, is in the, the um, anthem of the EU, European Union, of all things. It's a funny, funny thing, but um, you might know this song. I think it's Beethoven's most famous piece. Um, he says that, that there is this moment in that song 
where, where, where this happens. Uh, but anyway, that, that's a lot of text, even that small part uh, is not something we should really read together, but you can read that uh, on your own and try and understand what Adorno is saying there about the shudder. Uh, if you go to this slide, all these slides, are, I'm going to give you the slides after the lesson, so you will have them uh, in your Google Classroom. There's a YouTube video, and it's me, it's a short video I made about the shudder and Stranger Things. So you can just look at that as well, and that will give you a better idea of what Adorno's shudder is. Okay. One moment, what time is it? It's nearly five. Any questions? So I have a question about the notion of shudder. Yes. And uh, so right now, like we can get lost into an art world by some sort of form or technology, which is like, for example, virtual reality, that we put the goggle and get lost and detach ourselves from the reality, and jump into artificiality or virtuality. So it, maybe it's not a question, but it's like a confusion that I have that how much this technology pushing the human consciousness to the, to the virtuality and getting lost and just dealing with the unconscious, mm -hmm. triggered conscious through technology, through virtuality and detaching. So is it kind of harmful or kind of useful? Or is it like a technique that manipulating the sh sh notion of shudder just through technology when you are not understanding the static that you can kind of uh, enrich the artwork to the knowledge of aesthetic that create this charter as a moment for your viewer in your art piece. You know what I mean? I don't know if I um, clearly. Are you asking, but I mean, the first part I definitely understood you, you're saying that there are these experiences where you lose yourself in, for example, virtual reality um, and is is that a good thing could the shutter be found there but i think you're also saying that well maybe not because i think we, we have many negative feelings about True. These, these kind of things mm -hmm. uh, like if we yeah. think about um what this facebook is it meta what's this rebranding of facebook yeah meta mm -hmm. yeah and this the, the, yeah this presentation of this idea that facebook would be at the forefront of this kind of metaverse um this seems quite frightening if you think about, you know, you think about us becoming immersed in a in a virtual reality world that is run by Facebook, then it feels like it's going to be really about control, more control over us than anything. And then I'd be worried about whether we could experience the shudder in that environment. Um, so yeah, I think your question is is a good one. Uh, I mean, I think whether there's potential for the shudder online and within computer games is a really interesting area that hasn't really been explored, hasn't been explored fully. I, I, I tended to look a little bit at memes in a couple of books I've written. Um, I will say that they're completely different to the media that Adorno was looking at. And I think that memes are much more like, and, and computer games um, are much more like films and television that he was talking about, that he was criticizing and that he said were part of the culture industry. Uh, they're much more similar to that than to the kind of things that he was talking about when he talked about the Shudder. So when he talked about Shudder, he talked about um, things like Beethoven's music, um, often this composer Schoenberg, um, Stravinsky, and he talked a lot about writers such as Kafka and also the playwright Samuel Beckett um, and I think he thought these these kind of works were were more abstract in a kind of dark sense and that there's something about their abstract darkness and weirdness which could 
pull you out of the very safe false reality that capitalism presents. Um, I think with regard to what that means for today, I think we have to consider that. I, I, I don't think that internet media completely map on to uh, mass media, that we can't say like, okay, so Facebook is like TV, you know, memes are like av TV adverts or something like that. I think the experience is fundamentally different. So I think all we can do is take Adorno's uh, theory and use it ourselves, use it as a tool, and then we have to make up our own minds. And re with regards to virtual reality, virtual reality, I would say that's probably one of the most promising areas. Um, but I think that, bear in mind that Adorno was talking about abstract work. I didn't really explain this fully yet, but, um, you know, where his problem is identity thinking, that we try and identify and measure things too much, he proposes abstract work because in an abstract artwork, you can't identify. So his point with um, classical music, for example, is that when you're listening to it, you can't say like, you know, this is this, this is that. You know, you, you're not able to to categorize and, and recognize things. So it's, it's that moment of not being able to, to, to actually um, know what you're listening to or what you're looking at. That's what breaks you out of the normal confines of identity thinking. So I think that with regard to to um, virtual, reality, virtual reality, VR, uh, yeah, it has big potential, but I think it would have to be an abstract VR. And I think you know, probably there are these, these things. I don't really use VR very much, but I know like even back in the um, 1990s, if you had a PlayStation, there was a demo CD that came with the PlayStation and it had some demo games, but it also had a program that, um, I can't remember exactly how it worked, it would respond to music uh, and it would like, it had abstract shapes that would like, um, you know, that would, that would be just like VJ programs. You can get the same thing today on, on, on VJ, um, you know, VJs, you know, visuals for music. You can get these programs that um, randomly generate like fractal images and other images along with the music uh, and they're abstract. So, you know, I think there's this kind of similar thing. I'm sure it exists in VR, maybe you know something. Um, but I think, you know, something like this, uh, an abstract visual um, reality, which you can immerse yourself in, that maybe corresponded to music, I think might be an effective way um, of achieving the shadow, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah, but also like, VR has this ability that you, by putting a goggle, you already detach yourself from the reality, right? Yes. And you're already jump in to some sort of getting lost. So as soon as you put the goggle on, your body exists in the physical re real world, but your mind is somewhere else by just putting a goggle, even it just, representing another city yeah well that's true yeah um well that has a profound effect and it can be quite shocking and disturbing actually as well um i'm one of those people who can't really use vr because it makes me very dizzy immediately um so i'm maybe not the best person to ask but i, I think that um yeah, I mean, that fact of it changing your reality completely, and it really does change it. Um, I think you very quickly believe in, the, in what you're seeing. Um, so I think that's certainly something that should be studied. I just say that where, you know, where if you have a virtual reality city, you're not really challenging identification. You're just, you're just presenting a new identity. You see what I mean? So that the only way you really escape identification as such is if you had an abstract virtual reality. Uh, there was a question from someone else. No, maybe I, I was just thinking that sometimes when we experience some of the experimental VR, you know that some uh, artists or art students are making, sometimes you feel that strange, well, I mean, the physical 
uh, dizziness and uh, this strange phenomenon in your body when you are trying to uh, get in the uh, in the uh, you know you try to connect what you are seeing with your body and your physical environment but i guess that that's another kind of shock or another kind of shudder i don't I, I, you, I don't you know. can yeah you definitely can get a strange disconnect i had it once um it was a really strange thing and i went into a library a public library and they had like this vr display it's like you know you could try on these headphones and they weirdly had a vr of the same library um so it was just a vr of the space you were in anyway but it was slightly like um disjointed from reality so you know where you were you it, when you put on the headphones you were looking sorry the headphones the, the visor sorry you were looking at these stairs in front of you you know when you put the visor on they moved a bit and that was just that was shocking but then also the sounds you were hearing around you weren't corresponding to the vr so i remember that being quite disturbing i had to take off the headset quite quickly so that does shock you and it does have some ontological significance um i mean it challenges really like who you are and, and how you relate to reality so i think you definitely could say something about that and the shudder but i i wouldn't know exactly what i would say right now but i think it's definitely worth looking into i mean it challenges it does challenge identity because you realize that your own reality can be deceived that easily. And I think that does create a kind of shudder. And I think, yeah, I think actually it's quite similar to what Adorno's describing. Yeah, he, he wasn't really saying that. I think there is a case to say that that is a moment of shudder, yeah. Okay, there's someone in chat. Okay, you can also write down your questions in the chat. Um, okay, so we have some good questions there, but let's move on a bit with the slideshow. So, um, so Adorno's one of the main reasons he's talking about the shudder is that he believes that the potential of the artwork was ruined by the culture industry. So. The culture industry for Adorno is basically um, the film industry, the magazine industry, radio, TV, uh, newspapers, etc. Okay, so basically Adorno's argument, Adorno and Horkheimer's argument in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, written in the 1940s, was that what happened to all of society, that everything had become part of capitalism, everything had become identified under the capitalist system, that this also happened with art. So that at some point, art was like the only thing that you know, possibly stood outside of identification. But as we, we came out with mass printing and film and television, we ended up in a situation where, you know, culture itself, art itself became industrialized. OK. And Adorno then says, OK, so the only thing that could resist this is an completely abstract art now i'm just showing you this post impressionist uh, cezanne um, painting next to this meme because if you think about um what adorno is saying uh it's perhaps not entirely relevant to today okay um or at least shall we say if adorno is saying that that look um you know, you can no longer kind of look to art um, as a place for expressing freedom. That this doesn't exist because the culture industry has taken over, you know, art as such, has made it into a commodity. Yeah. Um, you know, we can't look to art anymore except in abstract art. Okay. So if he's saying that in the 1940s, then you might argue that that is even more the case today but that's much more much more the case today that if if um you know back then it wasn't possible to find uh a kind of free space you couldn't carve out a free kind of um 
zone in which you could, you know, make an artwork which was outside capitalism. That today, when we, you know, we have the internet, we have memes. Um, it's more or less, it's, it's more or less hopeless. So we, we're more or less without hope, they, they, even for the abstract artwork, arguably. You know, where are we going to find this abstract artwork that stands outside capitalism? It's like Mark Fisher says, you know, th th there's nothing that stands outside capitalism. Um, because if you make something on, on the internet that is somehow not capitalist, the, the minute you put it on the internet, you've already associated with Google, you know, with algorithms, you know, with, 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 with elements that are linked in to the capitalist system. So you can't really even have an anti-capitalist meme. And as for abstract memes, well, maybe, okay, maybe, but I'm yet to see an abstract meme that really evokes the shudder. Um, so we're dealing with a situation that's possibly much worse than that that Adorno was speaking about. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of counter argument. So that's like one argument that we could really say, you know, well, if things were really bad then, how bad must they be now? And it's, and it's very easy to be negative. And, and I think I'm seeing a lot of negativity online um, from young people. So, you know, some people, well, I mean, let's just say, look at, look at memes on Instagram, for example. I mean, there, there's a real kind of um, nihilistic, what we call black pill. I don't know if you know black pill, the black pill. Um, but anyway, just means nihilist, a, real, a really kind of nihilist um, feeling even among the online left. Um, so, you know, we could come to this course saying, you know, and the course kind of asks the question, what do we do next? Okay, what, what do we do next with memes, with art? How do we use these things post COVID to make a better world? We could say, well, basically we're doomed, but we can't do anything. And that might be, you know, what we choose to say. Um, but I just want to consider a different kind of angle. And I know somebody's asking a question, but if you just wait till later, I mean, it's fine to have your hand up, but I will get to it a bit later. So if you want to like put your hand up or raise any questions in the chat, by all means, but uh, just need to get through this little bit first. Um, okay, so we might see art uh, in the modernist period since the 1800s as rather than being a kind of steady move to control, to control of art, to art being controlled by capitalism, we might see the opposite thing happen. We might be seeing a steady move towards uh, freedom of expression, okay? So you probably know the Salon uh, de Refusé, yeah? Um, so this is like an iconic moment, super famous, it's maybe, almost a cliche to reference it, but I think it's somehow interesting in relation to, to meme culture, okay? So basically in the 1800s, uh, there was a situation in France where you could only really become a recognized artist who sells their work if you uh, were recognized by the Academy. So there was the French Parisian, uh, an art academy in Paris. Um, and basically in this art academy, um this art academy would, would hold exhibitions um every year and these professors of the academy they would basically choose the artists going into this show okay so they would be students of the academy i guess maybe other artists were invited and if you had the show in the art academy you would then be chosen for other shows okay in galleries and you would maybe have your works bought by collectors so it's a bit like today um where if you study at the Royal College of Art in London, you might know the RCA, uh, and you have your final master's degree show, you have a final exhibition at the end, then maybe Charles Saatchi or some other collector comes to your final show and they buy your work. Okay, so if you want to be a successful young artist, one way is to go to the Royal College or Goldsmiths College. These are both in, in Britain, but you'll know other examples in other countries. Uh, you have your final show and then maybe that way you get picked up by a gallery or uh, a collector. So it's a pretty crappy system, but it still works that way. So this was happening in France also. And what happened is the emperor of the time 
basically seeing the unpopularity of this situation because artists were starting to get really upset and you know really important artists today of that period weren't getting in the academy show like Cezanne um so the emperor basically said um you know I'm going to have a show for all the people who aren't allowed in the academy show so this was the salon des refusés which is basically just means the salon of refused artists um, so what you see here is an example of that show. So it was a, a, a show held in these, these huge um, spaces that was basically filled from top to bottom with, with works of people who have been rejected. OK, so there was a lot of rubbish in the show, to be fair, you know, but there was a lot of good stuff as well. Um, so it's well documented. Actually, Emile Zola wrote a book called The Masterpiece or called in French, my French is terrible, but something like Louvre, which means the work. Um, he basically wrote a book called The Masterpiece about this situation because Emile Zola was a childhood friend of Paul Cezanne. Okay, so Zola and Cezanne grew up together in the village and they moved to Paris together. And the, 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 their dream was moving to Paris very young, that Zola was gonna become a novelist and Cezanne was gonna become a painter. And they'd be famous and they actually ended up becoming famous um and zola wrote the masterpiece about um the salon de refusé about suzanne and suzanne's crowd and in the book there's a character called cloud lantier who is actually suzanne but he's not called suzanne um what happened is suzanne was so upset by the book that he never spoke to zola again because the portrayal of um suzanne in the book is quite negative OK, Suzanne was um, very anxious and depressive and the way that Zola portrays this upset um, Cezanne. Anyway, in the book, Zola talks about um, the laughter of the public um, when they saw the Salon show. So obviously, you know, so the public are told it's going to be a huge exhibition of people who aren't allowed into the official Academy show. So many, many people went, you know, wondering what they were going to see. And naturally their reaction would have been laughter, um, partly because they were expecting to see maybe poor art, but mostly because I think it was too radical for them to understand, okay? Um, but anyway, he documents the laughter at Cezanne's work. There were a lot of people who apparently, you know, really were laughing a lot, particularly at, at Cezanne's piece. Um, so, you know, I actually think the laughter was was um, also about something else. OK, so there were mixed reactions. There were laugh. There was laughter. There were also uh, people getting angry. There were people who ran out of the exhibition. And this happened not only in Paris, it happened again in 1910 in London when they held the first impressionist, po sorry, post impressionist show ever in London. Um, and um, basically you have a similar documentation of people laughing and people getting angry, et cetera, et cetera. So you might ask, okay, so why were people laughing at post-impressionist works? So basically we're talking about things like this, okay? Or it could be bowls of fruit, or it could be the Suzanne's nude bathers. Um, anyway, it's not very funny particularly, and it's not very, it's just not something that you think would make you angry or make someone run out of the exhibition. The thing is that, you know, what was happening is that prior to this time, paintings depicted Jesus, Mary, Greek mythology, you know, you basically had some, some very particular events, uh, stories that were depicted in painting or, or very rich people, kings and queens, aristocrats, etc. So um, when you were looking at a painting, you would normally be looking at a codified language. OK, so you were looking at some woman dressed in blue. So if you have an education at that time, you knew that was Mary. I mean, I guess most people back then would have known that was Mary, but and there were more obscure references. Um, I I iconic references um, that you would need a kind of privileged education to understand. So if you kind of get away from that and you're depicting mountains, okay, or you're depicting a bowl of apples, or you're depicting 
you know, just some nude bathers, not not nude naked bathers that are related to Greek myth, you know, but just nude people on a beach or something or somewhere. Um, you know, when you're doing that, you're suddenly taking away this privilege of the elite. OK, you no longer have to have a certain education to understand art. Um, so you know, there's some kind of advance in terms of the the the, 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 the sorry the democratic availability of art. Okay, um, I don't think you can doubt that there's been an advance. Um, okay, and then you get to obviously Duchamp's urinal. So you probably all know this story. So Duchamp in 1917, he submitted. Well, this is a, a, this is a debatable story because actually it's thought now that this urinal may have been submitted by a aristocratic woman friend of Duchamp, not Duchamp. OK, but this is a, a big debate. Um, so we have to be aware that this may not have been Duchamp's work and he may have stole it from a lesser known female artist. OK. Um, so in any case, somebody submitted this urinal. So it's, this is what you have in men's bathrooms um they they submitted this to an open exhibition so basically um duchamp was on a panel of an exhibition in new york um and the the idea of the exhibition is that anybody could submit the artwork it was basically like a salon their their refuse um there was an open call and it said you know anyone could submit any artwork to this exhibition and we will display it and then someone submitted this urinal and they refused to put it on display, yeah? And then sometime afterwards, Duchamp claimed that it was his. In fact, Duchamp took the urinal to a famous photographer, Alfred Stieglitz, and he asked him to photograph it. Um, anyway, the whole story becomes famous because then Duchamp claimed it was his and he claimed that uh, it was a provocation and that his provocation, uh, it proved that the exhibition was not really open to any artwork, but it was the beginning of um, not is it the real beginning because Duchamp had already done this a similar thing a few years earlier with a, a bottle rack, but it was the early stages of what we call the ready-made, the idea that anything can be art. Okay, the ready-made is like making art for something that's already already in existence, already made. Um, so you get a situation where now you know, anything can be art. Although Duchamp said only if the artist says so. So at this stage, anything can be art if an artist declares it to be art. Okay, so it's still elitist um, because you have to be an artist to choose, you know, which objects are art and which objects aren't art. Okay, so this gets to uh, Joseph Boyce, the artist. Uh, basically, he said, um, famously, the silence of Marcel Duchamp is overrated. OK, so I think I'm telling you so much stuff, I'm worried that I'm, I'm losing you. But OK, the reason we're here now looking at this is because, you know, Adorno's basic vision is that art basically isn't possible because of the culture industry. Only an extreme abstract art can really help us to kind of see the real condition of reality, that the true conditions of reality. Um, and so then I'm arguing, well, okay, that's maybe the case, but maybe, you know, there's not only one negative vision of, you know, an art that's being controlled more and more by capitalism, there's an other kind of contrary vision of an art that's becoming more and more democratic. So we see the Salon de Refusé, then the Fountain, and then you get onto Joseph Boyce, I guess you know Joseph Boyce. Uh, let's bring him up. Um, okay, so Joseph Boyce um, was a ready-made artist. Um, his life crossed over with Duchamp's. They were alive for some point at the same period, um, though Boyce lived longer. Um, lived on after. He was born after and lived on after Duchamp. Um, so I won't say much about Boyce, except that Boyce had this idea that we should make a new kind of communist international based on art. 
So he kind of saw art as fundamental to, to communism. And he had a famous saying, which is, we are all artists, okay? Um, so where Duchamp basically said anything can be art, but only if like a professional artist declares it to be art, okay? Boyce later said, the silence of Marcel Duchamp is overrated because he believed that Duchamp should have been more political, okay? His challenge to Duchamp was that if you're really kind of democratic, if you really believe in the art for everyone, um, you should extend your declaration that anything can be art so that anybody can declare anything as art, okay? So it was kind of a, a, an extension of the demo democratization of art. Okay, <clears throat> so that was like the contrary argument. Okay, so there's Adorno's extreme negativity. Then we kind of consider, well, actually, isn't, isn't art becoming more democratic? But then we swing back the other way. Okay, so I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna fall down on Adorno's side more than the positive side. Okay, so there was this big potential for the democratization of arts, okay? There has been a big potential, obviously. And I, and I can't deny that art has become open to more and more people, but we get this contrary tendency. Uh, think about um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, okay? And the way they're being uh, basically abused. I think NFTs have a huge potential. We can maybe talk about them at some point, um, but they're being, um, how can I say? They're being used by the finance industry. They're being used much like cryptocurrency. Okay. <clears throat> then you get to memes as well. Okay, so memes obviously give us a huge potential um, for democratizing art, but it's not that simple. So I think... Um, Let's just wind down and have a break in a couple of minutes of around 10 minutes, because <clears throat> I think you need to have a break and I need to have a break <clears throat> I need to get my voice back. Yeah, and I think Sophia has a question, maybe before okay. the break. Sophia, okay, Sophia, yes. Um, well, I was just going to say, um... I guess it's it's not so much a question so much as a comment um, that I don't really understand how abstract art could be subversive anymore, really, because um, I mean, may, maybe because what Adorno argues is, is more like more, more kind of the uh, response that it evokes in a viewer. But when it comes to production, like um, abstract art was used a lot in the Cold War by the State Department to um, kind of be a counter to socialist realism by fun funding like Pollock and artists like that. And um, you have a lot of artists now that make kind of uh, like ready, well, not, well, it's not really ready made art anymore, but it's, um, you know, very abstract arts that um, or kind of highly produced kind of conceptual art that um, is kind of made um, in a very capitalist way, like um, you have these artists that you know put it on their name, but they still have a team of other artists that are you know on a wage as well um, that kind of make it for them. So I I don't know. I feel like any art that would be subversive now would probably not be abstract anymore. When when Adorno wrote it, that made sense, especially because that was before it was used in the Cold War to counter socialist realism, but I have some doubts now of how subversive it is anyway. Yeah, I think they're all good points, yeah. Um, I mean, the point about Pollock, I mean, I, I think the CIA could have used Pollock. I mean, I know, I, I know they did, and, and you're right there. Um, there was this kind of notion that America was more free than Soviet Russia because they had abstract artists. But I think they could have, made that case and at the same time abstract art could still have had 
the effect that Adorno suggested, because the CIA might not have understood what they were really dealing with, or they had their own reasons to use it. Um, that they were using it for their own purposes, but it doesn't negate necessarily what abstract art could do. Um, although I still anyway agree with you that maybe abstract art can't do what Adorno said it could do anymore, but my reasoning is a bit is different. I mean, I think it's very hard to be in a concert hall um, or in a rave uh, party or anywhere with loud music and really lose yourself because even if you're not actually looking at your phone, or even if you have your ringer turned off, you still know that your phone might be sending you messages. You see what I mean? You're still often thinking about your phone. It's very hard not to be thinking about, if not your phone, just, you know, the fact of social media and that you may be receiving messages. I think we're so attuned now um, to this reality that the idea of completely zoning out and losing yourself in music or indeed art, um, I mean, as in, sorry, visual art, like painting, abstract painting, uh, the notion that this notion is, uh, is is very far removed from a reality. I mean, even if one isn't thinking about what messages they might be receiving, it still remains that our brain is so constantly interrupted that we we're not uh, accustomed to long periods of zoning out to music in the same way as we used to. So I think that yeah, I think it, it is hard to conceive of, of, of the shudder happening in that way today. Um, but your other points about artists making kind of making artworks kind of semi-industrially with studios of artists that they're paying or even not paying, you know, studios of assistants that they're paying or, you know, maybe even unpaid assistants or poorly paid assistants, etc. This is definitely a problem. Yeah, yeah. I think I think this is a big contradiction of the art world, and 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 I think it's why it makes it very hard to take seriously the notion of, of of art helping politically, either in an abstract sense, as Adorno suggests, or in a very directly political sense. And actually, Adorno was opposed fundamentally to very directly political art because he believed that it was also employed identity thinking. Um, um, but yeah, I, I think that that that. It's, it's hard to take seriously uh, political art within the contemporary art world today. So, I mean, I agree, I agree with all your points to some degree. Okay. Um, and okay, so if we want to take a quick break and come back about 45 past, Yeah, 40, 43, 44 past. Uh, I'll be here again then, okay? I'll be here for a little bit now if you have any questions and, and then we'll be back then to carry on the lecture. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I'm back here if anyone is ready or anyone has a question before we start. Okay, there's a few points here, questions coming up uh, in chat. Uh, can people hear me? Yeah. Um, basically, yeah, there's something coming up, coming up about um, whether or not Adorno was really talking about abstract expressionism or comparable kind of art forms. Um, yeah, as I said, I mean, he was speaking about people like uh, Schomburg, Stravinsky, actually Gustav Mahler as well, the composers, um, Kafka, Edgar Allan Poe, Samuel Beckett. So he wasn't generally talking about painting. Actually, he does mention painting a little bit in the chapter I gave you to read. Um, but yeah, somebody says here in the chats that basically they don't think that painting is comparable, abstract expression is comparable to the kind of things that Adorno was talking about, like Brecht, Beckett. I mean, I think that is a good point. I don't know that that uh, music affects you in the same way as painting or vice versa. I don't know that abstract expressionism affects you in the same way that music does. I think it can. I think I've seen the, um, the Seagram murals by Rothko um, she used to be in New York and now we're in uh, Tate Modern in Britain. These huge, uh, like, wine-stained kind of paintings, like, you know, burgundy and black abstracts. And they're so big, you do kind of get lost in them in a, in a similar way to the way that you can get lost in music. So I think it's possible, but I think generally not. Um, I wouldn't expect to get that sensation from a Pollock for sure. But yeah, and, you know, we're talking about abstraction. So I think sometimes it's, it can be useful for people to make the comparison with uh, abstract painting. Uh, I mean, it's a question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question, you know, worth, worth considering, you know, is abstract painting relevant? I mean, there was an essay called The Death of Sensuous Particulars the Death of Sensuous Particulars by J. Bernstein in Radical Philosophy, which you can look up. It's, I think it's probably online now, uh, where he talks about painting in relation to Adorno's work. So that might be worth looking into. Someone talks about um, Adorno and jazz. I mean, that's a complicated issue. Um, yeah, Adorno possibly said some stupid stuff about jazz. Uh, but I think he really meant culture industry music this is one thing that Adorno said jazz he didn't mean jazz in the way that we we mean jazz he was talking generally about what we sometimes call muzak m-u-z-a-c-k um, I think meaning like you know the kind of crappy music you hear in um, supermarkets and elevators um, he meant that more than actually jazz some comments on memes here. Uh, okay, there's a question here. Uh, your name written here is Akshat. Yes, hello, am I audible? Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, it, uh, partially it's like not a question, it's just uh, it would have been like too much to type out in the chat. So uh, there's like this excellent book uh, like which details the lives of all the Frankfurt School philosophers called the Grand Hotel Abyss, yeah. which was like a pejorative term that Lukács like coined against them. 
and so in that book uh, it is like detailed that adorno's um, understanding of jazz in part was like uh, he thought jazz was fascistic because his first exposure to jazz was sort of the nazi marching jazz bands uh, that they had in germany so like i do forgive him a little with respect to his faulty understanding of jazz for sure i, I think when he says jazz he's yeah he doesn't mean what we mean for sure yeah i hadn't heard that what you just said i hadn't heard that before but that that makes sense yeah thank you yeah um so if we just hold on a second are we all back i mean i guess it's a silly question i mean yeah there's 18 of us so um okay so yeah we did quite well that first part i think we got through quite a lot so that's like the real backbone um the theoretical backbone really of the of the course if you can understand adorno's shudder i think that mark fisher is driving at something similar um to that uh when he talks he, he makes allusions to the use of culture to counter to counter capitalism uh somebody has their mic on uh if you can just mute yourself again or can i mute people okay thank you uh right okay so um yeah, this notion that that the world has become completely commodified including art and there's no real resistance except through a kind of radically abstract art and whether that's still possible and, and uh, how we should be thinking about that in relation to memes that's really what we're talking about here except that uh you know we could also consider that maybe we don't only have recourse to abstract art, or we could even say that abstract art just isn't that useful anymore uh, or maybe it never was and maybe the art we should be making should 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 be figurative art you know because adorno had this big issue with figuration because he believed that figurative art that's art that depicts like you know things like people he believes that 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 was itself a form of identification of identity thinking um and that figurative art particularly art that expressed suffering uh for example the suffering of world war ii that played back into the horror of world war ii the representation of people um, being tortured, for example, it plays back into the negative tendencies which which cause those situations to arise uh, for Adorno. Um, the thing is, Adorno was talking during, well, before, during, and after World War II as a German Jew who had lost um, people he knew. Like famously, he lost Walter Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin died um, trying to escape. Uh, the Nazis. He actually killed himself, but he was trying to escape. Um, so, you know, Adorno is really looking back at a worst case scenario that manifested. And he's saying that if we, you know, make art about Auschwitz, the Holocaust, then we somehow feed back into that negativity. Uh, there's a famous line from Adorno um, it's impossible to make art after Auschwitz. This is, you know, probably the most famous Adorno quote. It's no longer possible to make lyric poetry after Auschwitz. There's different versions because he said the same thing a few different times in different essays. But, um, you know, he's really saying, he's really saying that it can't be possible to make art. It can't really be possible to make anything that's free, that, that, that can be thought of as free expression in the same society that gave us Auschwitz. That the conditions of freedom can't exist um the thing is we're not living now just after world war ii arguably some people might say we're in a position where we're trying to avoid something like world war ii happening and i don't mean the war because i think warfare is very different these days but you know the the extermination camps for example that they, there are these comparisons that are made sometimes that maybe aren't reasonable but you know sometimes people say you know was Trump heading towards becoming somebody like Hitler? Um, I mean, these things, are, they, they, they're not very um, convincing in a way because we just live in completely different times. We can't make comparisons. You know, I don't think we can really make those kind of comparisons. But 
you know, there's something that I think there's definitely a sensation that there's something we're trying to avoid, that we're heading towards uh, greater and greater control of, of, of people uh, by governments um, and by corporations. And that is the best way to avoid that, um, to, to make abstract art. Well, very possibly not. Also, you think about climate change. We're trying to address this problem of climate change and make governments take responsibility. How are we going to address that through abstract art? We may be much more in a position where we need to go into the streets with artworks, you know, that are somehow useful to protest. And they may be figurative artworks. Um, so Sophia is saying that there's an oncoming climate catastrophe. Well, yeah, so in that case, I, I mean, one, one could say, well, okay, if there's a catastrophe coming, why don't I just zone out and enjoy my abstract art? But then you could say, well, it's time to descend into the streets and we need artworks that are very clear about what they're saying. Um, I think maybe the kind of thing that we see with Extinction Rebellion, not everybody is convinced by them, but the activist group Extinction Rebellion, they use art, which is very figurative. So, um, you know, there's, there are different angles here, but, you know, basically the fundamentals there, you know, have been understood that, you know, we, we live in a society where everything is commodified. Can art help us find a way out? And can memes help us find a way out? That's basically what we're looking at on the course. As we've kind of got through a lot of that, I think it might be a wise idea if you can all just introduce yourself um, briefly. Um, I think, mean, you know, we don't have very much time, so it would have to be literally a few words. So if you can just say maybe your names, where you're from, and what your main concerns are theoretically and politically perhaps that would be really helpful um i'll make this maybe easier by picking somebody uh rodolfo do you want to start uh, hi yes i am rodolfo uh rodolfo Sousa. i am from mexico uh, i don't live in mexico city i live in the province um, so I'm a visual artist and I'm a teacher of, uh, of art in a university. I work mostly, and one of my main researches are gossip, uh, and, uh, you know, the degradation and erosion of images through, uh, over codification, piracy, even memes, um, so basically that's kind of the things I, uh, I research and obviously uh, memes are one of my favorite subjects in, as image and as a, a research. That's okay, mm-hmm. brilliant. Okay, thank you, cheers. Um, somebody else? Sophia? Uh, hello, I'm Sophia. I'm also from Mexico. Um, is my mic working? Yep. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I don't live in Mexico, but um, I'm I'm taking a gap here. I got out of high school earlier last year, um, so I'm yeah I'm taking a gap here. I thought this would be a good use of my time. Um, I do run a meme page on Instagram, a lefty meme page, but I'm not, I will not I will I will, I will not say which one it is. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot in the last year is um, like what the role of, um, or I, I guess, well, I guess particularly on, on the internet and how, how much um, like that co opts um, any movement that we can build and kind of. Um, like to what extent we should be online and building things offline. And if we're online, maybe to lessen that co-option to what extent we should, um, I guess, form our own channels to to kind of build something. And if that's something that we should do, or if we, we should instead, uh, I guess, use what exists there, even if it's you know, Facebook or 
yeah. if, even if it's owned by Facebook or you know some other giant tech company. And um, I guess kind of, um, I guess to what extent that's productive and um, uh, yeah, I guess um, I okay. guess that's why I quite like Mark Fisher's work and the uh, situationist idea of uh, the tournament. And I think that's a very useful concept. Um, okay. yeah, sorry to ramble. Oh, that's right. No, that's good. That's all good. Good points. And I think that that will, will be very useful on the course. Okay. Uh, Veronica. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm from a Prague, Czech Republic, and I'm master studies, uh, master student of uh, film studies and new media studies. And yeah, my research is not on memes, unfortunately, it's on how to archive unarchivable digital artifacts, actually. But I did one research uh, based on memes, uh, analysis, or rather analysis of memes of uh, Tarkovsky and Kubrick, which was fun. And uh, also analysis of one trend in memes, that, which is like gold uh, sparrow, like in, from artwork. So yeah, this is my sort of what I did with memes, but beside it, I just consume memes because they are everywhere. Okay, brilliant. That sounds really interesting. The unarchivable internet objects. Okay, um, thank you. Someone else, I think I'm just gonna go straight through the list as I, as I see you. So that would be Akshat next. Um, am I audible? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. Um, so I'm um, a novelist and a poet. I'm from India. And um, I recently finished my second novel and it uh, thematically dealt with mimetics and like this whole uh, aspect of political propaganda via memes and totalitarian control via memes accelerationists and how they can be um, like sometimes very dumb not accelerationists the writers but accelerationists as in facebook accelerationists or like the people who are in groups um i've been uh, like a part of what we call phil book from like the very early days philosophy phil book and like i've been involved like with like a lot of the meme pages and like I've admin some as well, uh, admin some groups as well. And uh, so it has been very interesting for me to see the like evolving growth of these things over the last six or seven years. And a lot of us I've seen like um, end up involving mimetics in our personal projects. So novelists are um, going to uh, inject this idea of like whole social media mimetics into like their novels and then like people who are writing, like working in philosophy there uh, and have been involved with philosophy, Facebook or Phil book uh, are injecting those ideas into their philosophical research. So one of my main like interests with respect to uh, your work particularly and with Mark Fisher's unfinished uh, asset communism was to see strategies that could um, result in what I would like to think of as post um, postmodernism, something like that can resist uh, this um, like bad art of postmodernism and like this whole cultural industry of postmodernism. So like I'm really interested um, in seeing that and the strategies that can get us out of that maybe. Okay, thank you. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, Eleni, Eleni. Hi, uh, I'm Eleni. Uh, I'm from Greece. I am a visual artist uh, and a graduate of Royal College that you mentioned earlier. Um, my work uh, tries to um, to blur the limits in between uh, dream and reality. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Ah, and I do NFTs. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, Nima. Hi, uh, 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nima and I'm from Iran. Right now I live in Boulder, Colorado. I'm doing my PhD in Emergent Technology and Media Art Practices in the University of Colorado. And I'm a, an artist dealing with multi-channel video installation and technology. And my research is based on the repressed and invisible element in capital societies and using them as a zero point for starting a creative practice. And uh, yeah, and the, 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 like, uh, and my relationship with mean is that, as you mentioned about identity and the mean, we don't know who created these means. That's why I really like the, the value of mean as a form of uh, the, the identified author that how much it detached from the body of the creator as like a, like a, like, we don't know what, what was the purpose behind creating the mean and is the mean meme mean or not mean, which is very interesting for me. Sometimes it's very offensive when I watch memes and read memes, memes, but sometimes it's very funny. And like this double edged sword of meme is very interesting for me. And how much we observe meme in like before internet era, as we can observe that in our like humor and jokes. Yeah, okay. that's it. Yeah, very, very good. good, thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, Zenobio, are you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. So I, I'm Zenobio. I'm a design and researcher based in Brazil, and I'm very interested in meme making. Although I've never, uh, I I've never actually I, I I've tried, but I I I I, I feel that uh, there's there's uh, especially you know like a, a philosophical kind of meme memes and theory gram uh, kind of things because I I usually uh, did in my in my work this kind of translation to uh, from philosophical concepts to diagrammatical and graphic design thing so I guess in, in one point it would be kind of nice to, to try and experiment with this uh, format and this this uh, theory uh, theory gram and theory theoretical uh, memes because I I guess and, and it's it's something I've been uh, an avid uh, consumer and I've actually learned a lot about uh, uh, philosophy. It was my kind of philosophy 101. It was theory gram. So it's, it's, it's still, it's, it, it still is. And, and I guess it's at one point I would like to, to try to, to produce these kind of things, you know, and, and, and I guess, uh, I guess with this kind of format, uh, a kind of mix and uh, with type and image and some kind of uh, meta meaning, of something works very, very well with uh, philosophy represented in memes, and it, 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 it not 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 also like political memes, but also very kind of uh, deep. So so this this is I I'm trying to 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 ask him myself if this is possible. You know, kind of a. Uh, teaching or kind of uh, spreading philosophy through through memes. So th this is something I'm, I'm interested in. Okay, so, uh, great. Well, we'll get an opportunity to speak about all of that uh, as we go. Ivan, Ivan. Hi, uh, do you hear me? Yes, hi. Yeah, so um, I'm Ivan. Um, I'm from Prague in Czech Republic. Um, I finished masters in uh, theoretical and evolutionary biology. Now I'm studying PhD course, uh, um, history and philosophy of science. Um, 
I also work in Prague at the Center for Theoretical Research, where I focus on sound studies. Uh, yeah, memes. Uh, who doesn't love memes, right? Uh, I love creating them. I love scrolling through them. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't have any like such, such the uh, theoretical philosophical uh, insight in memes as the previous talkers, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, no worries. But we'll, we'll be talking about that anyway as we go. We can all develop some ideas. Um, Daria. Yeah, hi, I'm Daria. Um, I'm based uh, in Ukraine. Um, actually, um, I'm completing my MA in sociology now in Kyiv. Um, I used to call myself a researcher whose interest lies in um, like um, in different infrastructures, both material, political, and also social that uh, lies, um, that um, frames um, um, are certain, um, politi certain political uh, actions, uh, especially in uh, Eastern Ukraine. And um, I've also used to write about art, um, uh, mainly uh, my interest uh, was um, about this uh, distinction between uh, material objects and writing um, in feminist discourse. Um, but now due to some uh, political turmoils of recent months, it's really hard to kind of describe myself and my um, fields of interest in like fixed terms. So I'm just simply trying to find some motivation to do something at all. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry to hear the difficulty and hopefully you can help, we can help you find some motivation here. Um, Ikaro. Oh, hang on. See, there's no record anymore. So can we have an even um, Veronica. Have oh, Veronica, we already had you. Yeah, okay. So now I'm, I'm confused. Um, Michael. Hi guys. Um, my name is Michael. Apologies in advance for the. The noise in the background i'm in a public setting at the moment but um i have just graduated with a ba i'm based in london i'm russian um i'm an artist a visual artist um i my practice sort of based around performance and i'm very interested in um, the sort of the states of um performance hypnosis and i guess that sort of relates to dorno's shudder in a way i'm also a big fan of your work mike and i also really am interested in mark fisher's work and i'm yeah that's about it i'm very happy to, to be part of this great thank you cheers um vienna yeah should be the last person there hi can you hear me now yeah hi hey, yeah hi hi i'm Una. I'm uh, um, an architect and artist currently based in uh, Athens. Uh, I've also graduated from the Royal College of Art. Um, my main interest is um, spaces and bodies, and particularly in the hybrid context that we live in. Uh, right now, uh, I'm interested in the physical attachments uh, is basically how strong is our physical attachment to our virtual habits and what kind of uh, permissions and restrictions we comply with and we exercise in our everyday practices and what kind of material and immaterial protocols do these practices um, entail. So hopefully we're going to go through some of, the, of these points in our discussions for sure yeah okay thank you and thank you everyone thank you. and let's now return here but really interesting to hear something about you all 
Um, we now have not very long, do we have? We have 15 minutes. I can stay around for an extra 10 minutes for questions if, any, if anyone wants to stay on. Um, but with the 15 minutes, I'm just going to have to talk solidly, I think, because we have quite a lot to get through. So, um, okay, so I gave you in the reading this essay by Walter Benjamin, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which I guess some of you were already familiar with. Others of you may have had a chance to have a look. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, then try and look at it. It's um, it's an essay. It's not a, a full book. Probably takes probably takes you a couple of hours, maybe, to read through. Basically, the essay I find important because uh, it has huge parallels with today. So, in the essay, Walter Benjamin talks about famously the the aura, which is this is spelled A U R A, aura or aura. And um, the aura is something that the the individual artwork has. It's kind of a semi-spiritual quality that Benjamin attributes to the uniqueness of the artwork. So if you take something like the Mona Lisa, the actual original Mona Lisa has this kind of quality of, of being somehow special, of somehow being more than just an object. OK, so you think about the way that artworks have this kind of glow that, you know, you can't see, but you kind of sense that there's something that goes in excess of the artworks material properties. So, um, I mean, this essay is famous for 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 this aura, but actually it's a it's, it's kind of the least important part of the essay. So many people get kind of stuck on the aura. or That's the bit that's talked about. You know, often in universities everywhere. Um, but Benjamin kind of introduces the aura very early on and then moves on to something quite different. So he, he starts to talk about uh, the artwork in the age of mechanical reproduction. And by that, he means the mass production of images principally. Um, and he talks about how in the 1900s in the early 1900s up to the 1930s where he's when he's writing suddenly people had many many more images than they were used to seeing at any kind of moment before that so in the 1800s in your house you may have had a picture of jesus yeah and you may have had in in, in western or, or in christian countries you know um you may have had a picture of of jesus maybe mary you may have had you know, a book somewhere in your house with some pictures in. You may have had a family portrait, okay, but you only had probably a handful of images in your house. Otherwise, you would see images in local museums, in churches, in schools, okay. Um, suddenly, from the late 1800s going through to the 1930s, you, you, you had like this mass proliferation of printed images and people could suddenly see way more stuff than they could ever see before okay so benjamin argues that this gave people an appetite for more wealth that people seeing so much stuff suddenly wanted to own more things okay so he argues that the you know the, the aura of the artwork gets lost in this process so where the mona lisa has this aura linked to it being the original artwork you know that was made by um now i'm going to say something stupid it was made by da vinci you know um and then it was passed down you know through the hands of famous collectors and and and, and even i think uh did napoleon ever own it i don't know but it passed it passed through the hands of some very wealthy important people so it has this special status okay so you know when that mona lisa ends up being printed I don't think Benjamin talks about the Mona Lisa really, but I'm, I'm talking about the Mona Lisa. When, when that ends up being printed on postcards, on posters, on biscuit tins, T-shirts, it loses its aura. OK, so these the reproductions of the Mona Lisa don't have the same value um, that the Mona Lisa has. OK, um, but this is kind of a passing reflection. Benjamin says that, but then he says, but what you have instead is you get a situation where, where many, many more people 
can see the Mona Lisa. Many more people can see art. And, you know, they start to demand, um, you know, as a result, they start to demand more property wealth. OK, they, they start to think, OK, I want some of the stuff I'm seeing, like not the Mona Lisa, but, the, you know, the wealth depicted in, 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 in these paintings, um, in films, uh, in magazines, etc., etc. So Benjamin says that the fascists in this period identify people's need or desire for more stuff and they, they diverted that attention away from you know property wealth itself so rather than give people the stuff they wanted rather than realign um you know realign uh, class boundaries or or um pay people more money for their jobs um rather than redistribute wealth is what i'm looking to say rather than redistributing wealth they distracted people through fascist parades through propaganda posters they gave out radios to every household through films nuremberg rallies etc um they basically uh, took people's hunger for more objects and converted this um into an adoration for for well for hitler for example but also they took this kind of um, desire for more wealth and they started to scapegoat people so they started to say well, you don't have more wealth your, your problem now you want more stuff because you're seeing more stuff in films etc uh, it's not you know it's not that we're not giving you enough wealth it's that for example the jews have taken it or yeah you could have more wealth but we'll need to invade countries in the east we'll need to invade uh russia for Lebensbaum, living space in the east okay so think about that and then think about what's been happening in the last few years and think about instagram think about twitch uh youtube etc and think about what that's doing think about how much we're seeing in terms of images ever than before sorry the, how, how many more images we're seeing than ever before and think about what that's doing to people's minds and the way in which you know people are now expecting more stuff but not just more stuff you have a situation today where we're making more choices than ever before so people are expecting to be able to make choices um we have access to information so people expect to be taken somehow seriously you know as seriously as experts um because we can all google stuff yeah um and then think about how governments have responded to this so you get a situation where people expect to be able to make choices so boris johnson in the uk says to the public boris johnson and and and, and other campaigners for brexit said that i want to give you control of your destiny you deserve control of your destiny so you can choose to take yourselves out of europe okay or trump says we can build a wall Okay, he, he, he told the public that they, they would build a wall to keep out um, migrants across the Mexican border, um, which again is scapegoating, you know, foreigners as, as or foreigners or minorities as as um, the Nazis did in the in the 1930s and 40s. Um, so we have a very similar situation, okay, where um, the populist right are basically offering things to people and scapegoat, scapegoating people to distract people from the wealth that they're expecting to have as a result of Instagram, Twitch, etc. Okay. So that's why I find that essay an important essay. And that's just a meme I made. Uh, that's Walter Benjamin. Sorry, that's why that's what you're looking at. So it's Walter Benjamin who wrote the essay. And it's just a variation on the on um on a meme format, popular meme format. Um, but okay, so there's some, you know, some interesting questions that arise from that, because what Benjamin is saying is that films and things like that, you know, films, media, mass media, you know, they offer people a level of wealth that they can't actually obtain. In reality, we have something a bit different today, because if you think about Twitch, Instagram and YouTube, they do offer wealth but they also actually give you potential to earn wealth okay so it's not quite the same thing um there's a level of uh, agency 
that arises from Twitch or from the internet, shall we say, uh, from internet platforms that has never been seen before. So we're not entirely in the situation that Benjamin and Adorno were in. And if Benjamin and Adorno's complaint is that the media is a top-down experience that is used by the elite to control the masses, or that you know the media offers things, and then the the same elite that make the media then distract people from from obtaining these things. Um, that's not exactly what's happening today. Something a little bit different is happening. So we have to question again if we need to be entirely negative or if there is some room for positivity. Um, can we not use these platforms for good? And of course, then you get the left internet, um, left tube, uh, left meme making, etc. So we can't doubt there's been a massive growth in, in left cultural production uh, in the last few years. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Um, this massive growth in left cultural production makes me think of the theory blogging era so basically you know all no blogs uh, simple websites uh, where you can like you know write essays and things um there was a period that began in the early 2000s when there were many many people writing blogs around philosophy and left-wing theory and that's when mark fisher became very well known for his blog K-Punk, which he, he started in 2003. Uh, and then you've got many, many others like Object Oriented Philosophy, which is actually Graham Harmon, who you might know. Larval Subjects, um, which is Levi Bryant. Sit Down Man, You're a Bloody Tragedy uh, was Owen Hatherley. I don't know if it still exists. Speculative Heresy. heresy. Uh, I'm, I'm looking like you're looking at my are you looking at my slides? Oh, you are, yeah. For a moment, minute then I thought you, you weren't able to see them. Okay, so that's good. Okay, speculative heresy, um, which is, or was Nick Cernacek and Alex Williams. Uh, Lumpen Professoria, I don't recall who that is, um, but we have some examples here. So this is one, this is um, again, Levi Bryant, larval subjects so this is how the blog looked um back then i don't know when he actually started this one i remember looking at it oh look 2006 so i was started looking at it maybe 2007 um aesthetically they were very simple i mean this was kind of previous version of the internet okay the, the, the tech we're seeing here is like image text image text it was never much more People didn't tend to include video. Uh, if you look at the date, 2006, 2007, when it began, not that many people were using Facebook at that point. I think the real kind of take up of Facebook globally was around 2007. That's when I started using Facebook. So people who were gathering to talk about theory weren't doing it on large social media platforms. They were doing it around these blogs. And what you had is a situation where these people would be keeping these blogs and they would have comment sections and people would leave comments and that would start conversations and the conversations would maybe carry on in email so you can see levi bryant actually has his email here um so you know i could have emailed levi bryant i probably did back then uh one of the really important things here is that okay we were living in a time still in 2006 2007 certainly back in 2003 when Fisher started K-Punk, when you couldn't, you couldn't talk to your own professor very easily in many countries. There was still this big uh, distance between the professor and the student. I don't mean just a professional, you know, normal professional distance, but, you know, they weren't really available to be talked to. They didn't really expect emails either um so you know a lot of people you know couldn't really get decent feedback from their own professor but suddenly you could email mark fisher or levi bryant or graham Harmon, who were you know people who were well known in their field so it really broke down the distance between academics and and uh students for example so it was a really important period um that changed things a lot 
because at that point there were very few philosophical journals that had control over the world of philosophy, radical philosophy, for example, for one. Um, but they were very elitist. It was very hard to get into these journals. So it really changed things. Um, so it was a very exciting period. And just look at what another one. That one actually has video on it. But um, anyway, so I was a little bit involved in this. I used to um, email some of these people um, and I actually had a blog. I don't think it exists anymore. I don't think it's online. I have one called Logical Regression. Um, it wasn't particularly successful, but I was in this network um, and it suddenly kind of collapsed. Everything's just suddenly stopped at some point. I mean, the, the thing is that I mean, people kept these blogs partly because they couldn't get published. And Mark Fisher wasn't getting published. I, I, he, he wasn't finding publishers for books. He wasn't ever in radical philosophy, I don't think, the journal, uh, which was kind of like the most important journal in the UK at the time for philosophy. Um, and then, of course, Zero Books, the publisher, it kind of grew up with a specific intention of starting to publish these bloggers. If you look at who the, who, the first kind of you know, a handful of books that were published by Zero Books. They were all prominent bloggers who weren't getting published. Um, you know, they weren't getting books published. Fisher was publishing a lot of magazines and journals, but not, not um, books. Um, and what happened partly is a number of these bloggers became so famous they couldn't keep a blog anymore. They were so busy, they couldn't blog. But another thing happened, and that is basically that Facebook became really a big deal. And people started talking about philosophy on Facebook, it doesn't really happen now, but for a brief period, there was a lot of activity of people who were blogging and, and other people like Reza, Reza Negrastani, who teaches at the New Centre. He used to be on Facebook, I don't know if he's still on, but there used to be massive long philosophy th threads on his own Facebook where he'd be talking with Nick Cernacek and people. He has a blog as well, it says here, uh, but he was also, I mean, he used to, have, I, I remember seeing some quite involved um, philosophy debates on Facebook between him um, and Nick Cernacek was often on Facebook talking about stuff. So my, my point here is not that uh, Razor Negrestani didn't have a blog, but just that, that Facebook started to serve a purpose um, you know, where people realized you could do anything on Facebook. So people started migrating there and then Facebook ended up just being a distraction. Social media started to change in its pace and people just, you know, basically didn't have time to think anymore. And, and blogs basically just dropped off. Maybe people got older, they took on responsibilities. And blogging, you know, basically slowed down and even stopped. If you look at most of these blogs now, this says 2014 was the last post. If you look at Larval Subjects, um, I think 2020 was his last post. So some of them were going until quite recently. And of course, there is um, a kind of new blogging era with people like, uh, Zeno Gothic and other people. So there is this kind of growth again of, of blogging, but basically it kind of collapsed and, and in a void, they grew up um, more recently left tube and internet meme making, but that's a kind of different subject. That I think now we're not gonna get onto today. So next week, we're gonna start with thinking about memes and how they maybe grew up in the space, you know, where blogging used to be and if it's a good, replacement and then we're going to go on and talk about acid communism um obviously i can't keep you longer so i think it's the end but i'm going to stay around for a few minutes if you have any questions if you want to stay around and and then yeah everyone for your homework i mean you have reading for next week try and do that um also get yourselves in groups of four if you can and think about your main topic for your presentations and your memes. So basically in your groups, you're gonna make an, a kind of activist meme campaign. So just like make your groups, think of your topic and find some memes off the internet. So you're basically gonna be sharing these memes at the beginning of next uh, seminar. So what you'll do is you'll come in, you'll tell me what your groups are. And, um, I don't know if you'll be able to screen share, I guess so. I can ask about that.
and uh basically yeah you'll just basically talk talk about your memes so you find memes that relate to the same topic that you're going to be dealing with and we'll just debate how useful these memes are that you're showing us and then we'll get back on with a lesson um so i guess we'll have an hour of talking and then i'll be talking for an hour and a half straight okay so any questions from anyone um how should we get into groups I, I, that's a good question. I don't know how well you know each other. Uh, and if that's something that's very easy, some of you don't know each other. Omar and you, yeah. Um, do you want to us to work that out for you? Or, just... may, sorry, maybe um, Janice, we can, you can make the, you know, the Excel, like the one we make for groups most of the time. Or I don't know. Yeah, and each of you write your name with anyone you want, and yeah, uh, is that clear to everyone? No, uh, I don't. I don't get what you mean. Like we will uh, have all names, and we will put our names uh, next to people that we want to work with. I mean, I don't know anyone, so. Yeah, most uh, of the time when, but when we can, when we make the, you know, the group presentations for other seminars, they, they give us an Excel sheet. So we, we put our names in a, in a line or a column and that's all. I mean, and I, I think that's what's gonna happen. And I can put your email so you can talk each other to make a remnant of the topics. Yeah, it's tricky because it's, I don't actually understand myself what you would do because like you say, well, you have an Excel and then you put your names. But how are you going to do that without coordinating? I mean, well, you have, on the Excel, what you can have like group one, two, three, four, and then people just put their names underneath like that uh maybe if like somebody if you start something something like an excel and you have like groups one two three four i don't know how many groups we have to say we have five groups and somebody put a name down into one with their preferred topic then if we already have five people who put their names into the five groups with their preferred topic the other people can more easily join so you know if you make that excel and somebody people who have like strong ideas on what they want to do jump in that excel straight away put down their preferred topic and then everyone else can basically join up with them. Does that make sense? That's an idea. I mean, I'll leave it to you and see if it works. Okay, uh, any other yes, questions? I, I send the shell with the presentation and everyone puts your name and the topic and if you want the topic, you write your name next to them more more or less something like that will work i mean you have, you have to work out the exact format but yeah okay uh Akshat. um so mike you, oh, usually in other seminars what happens is uh like the topics are um assigned by the instructors yeah i don't think that's very useful if you have to like seriously uh, engage with this. It's no good me giving you a topic that you know might not even fit in with your own political outlook. Um, um, let's try it with you. Let's try it with you forming the groups between you and, and deciding your topics between you and see how that goes. Okay, uh, I'll, I'm going to stay here. So if anyone has questions, I'll still be here for a minute. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then if you want to go, then then you can leave. Yeah. In a few minutes, I send the presentation to write your name. So that's it.
so um mai kai recently saw like this is not very seminar uh, related but i recently saw that you like left asset communism and that you're starting your own separate project um yes um sorry i was looking at some comments uh i did leave asset communism yeah yeah i announced it online and i will start a new a new podcast soon and it will be much more around activism i'll be speaking to activists um regularly the asset com the asset left um it didn't really work for me anymore i think i need my own platform it was it, i i really like adam but it was quite difficult to always agree on something best of luck with it okay yeah thank you cheers okay anyone else want to do yep okay i'm going to start the recording if there is any question we have like 5 minutes left thank you everyone to come Okay, thank you, everybody. Um...